Hey, it's Andrew, and today on the show we have David Skok, a four-time founder, investor, and author of the blog For Entrepreneurs. We chat about how David evaluates startups to invest in, the definition of product market fit, and what he looks for after it. We also discuss the importance of churn and retention in the investment evaluation process, the key characteristics that companies with great retention share, and the power of negative churn. David also shared what a healthy LTV to CAC ratio should be, why the time to recover CAC is critical, and what attracted him to SaaS to begin with. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. If you have any feedback, I would love to hear from you, and you can email me directly on andrew at churn.fm. Enjoy the episode. This is churn.fm, the podcast for subscription economy pros. Each week, we hear how the world's fastest growing companies are tackling churn and using retention to fuel their growth. How do you build a habit-forming product? We crossed over that magic threshold to negative churn. You need to invest in customer success. It always comes down to, to retention and engagement. Completely bootstrap, profitable, and growing. Strategies, tactics, and ideas brought together to help your business thrive in the subscription economy. I'm your host, Andrew Michael, and here's today's episode. Hey, David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Great to be here. Yeah, it's excellent. It really is an honor to have you on the show. As I mentioned uh, to you, like really big, big fan of your work. Uh, for the listeners who are not familiar with David and his work, he's a five-time entrepreneur. He's the author of Four Entrepreneurs Blog. Uh, it's probably Eric as one of like the SaaS Bibles. I would recommend it. Uh, recommended reads. Uh, he's also a general partner at Matrix Partners, and he's a board member on several different companies, of which HubSpot is one of those. And uh, it'd be interesting to touch on some of that today. Uh, thanks for joining. Good to have you. Yeah, pleasure. Cool. So, uh, as mentioned, like one thing I wanted to touch on today, um, and definitely is coming from your perspective as an investor now, we'll, we'll go back onto the entrepreneur side a little bit later. But to start off, I wanted to sort of get an understanding and your thought process when it comes to how you go about evaluating a startup uh, when you think about investing it in, and what are some of the key metrics that you're looking at and why? Got it. Okay. So, um, the, the one of the most important things for us when we're investing is the founder. Uh, so we will spend a lot of time trying to understand whether we think this founder has a particular edge, particularly in say they say they've been in this domain area that they're working in uh, for several years and they have a particular understanding of that industry and how to disrupt it and whether they're the right person to be doing that disruption. Uh, and do we believe that they have the kind of grit? Uh, and intelligence and the ability to attract other key management players and be able to sell customers. So they, they need to be good at selling and, and yeah. uh, evangelizing. So once we got through that, we would then um, start to look at what is the, the nature of this product. And particularly important for us, if we're investing at a stage where there's a little bit of traction, is to understand what kind of product market fit they have. And I think churn is really an incredibly good indicator of that. If they have high churn, then it's really an indication that the product isn't working, and that's a bad sign, a very bad sign. So we really care yeah. a lot about you know, do they have product market fit. Um, so that, that would be one of the early ones. And sometimes we might go further than that. If, if, if it's too early to really judge that, we might ask to see what's happening with um, usage patterns of customers that they signed up by cohort. So we, we look through, and we might even ask to see every single customer and how their, you know, their revenue or usage has trended over time to give us a sense of whether this product is actually working, is really delivering the benefits of yep. what they said that they would be delivering. Um, so that's, that's where churn comes in. And I think um, for, for other things that we would care about, we really care about a large market. Uh, VCs, the, the way our model works is we need to create these really big winners, things that are fairly small, do not cover the, um, you know, the, the losses that you have in this high-risk business. So you have to have big yeah. winners. So you care, care about finding big markets. You look for things like defensibility. Is there a way where this business model can actually um, have some significant defensibility? And you're really ideally looking for things that are significant and big. So um, at this moment in time, for example, we still will see a lot of people who are, who are looking for the nth degree of how they're going to fine-tune sales enablement 
it's not really that interesting. Uh, yeah. We want the idea that's kind of a truly a big idea that's going after something unique that's not just an incremental uh, twist of a tweak of something that's already out in the marketplace out there. Going to change the way people work. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you've got to believe that this company is well positioned to be the winner in the marketplace and that you're not seeing the company that's well positioned to be maybe number two or number three, because that's really not where the win winnings typically go to. Yes. So, so, so oh, sorry. And so I, I gave you there the early, earlier stage company. Yeah. There is also another phase of company that we evaluate, which is a little bit further down the line where they've got a bit of growth happening. And in that particular case, I really care about, you know, once I've established that they have product market fit, my next question is how far are they in the journey to getting a repeatable, scalable, and profitable growth process? And those three words are incredibly carefully chosen words. They, Because they, yeah. if you have something that you can repeat and that you can scale up and that's also profitable, you should be hitting the gas and investing like crazy in that because it's going to create profit for you. Um, even if it might take a little bit of time, you know, you invest a dollar, it might take three years before you get the four dollars back out of the thing. Yeah. But, um, and those three words tend, tend to be very easy to say, but really hard to achieve as a startup founder. Uh, so I typically will find that somebody's halfway through getting to predictability, has shown a little bit of ability to scale, and has really maybe got some early indications that they can be profitable. And we can invest in that because it's maybe enough indicators there that if we you know, we think we can see a path to solving all the rest of it. But if they're really well through that journey, then they're going to get a higher valuation and there's less risk associated with the business and, and it's much easier for us to get behind it. And de-risk your investment as well. Uh, you, you touched on uh, product market fits as well uh, twice uh, now, and I think it's definitely like a, a topic that's probably most often misunderstood. And it'd be interesting to hear sort of from your perspective, like what is product market fit? Okay, so product market fit to me is when you're able to demonstrate that you have a, a decent number of customers that are in a single sector with a single use case that are all successfully using the product and getting the business benefits from it that you promised that they would get. And I mean business benefits, not just usage. They're not just using the product. Yeah. Uh, and if you decided to take it away from them, they would scream like crazy and say, no, we, you know, we, we need this thing. This is absolutely essential for us. Yeah. Um, and you're not seeing churn in people using the product or churn in people paying you for the product. And they should be paying you for the product as well, because if they're not paying you, then it's evidence yeah, that it's maybe not it's an important enough pain point. Yeah. And, and as for how many customers that means, it, it would be a minimum of 10, but if you're a very low price product, it probably goes to be a much higher number than that, something like a 50 to 100 customers that you'd want to see to have evidence of that. And, and I do want to be clear here, that's early product market fit. Even a company as large as HubSpot still is constantly adjusting to get better product market fit. Um, so you're never finished with that journey, but that's sort of evidence that you're in, in the early enough stage to be interesting to a VC to, to invest in. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is, well, product market fit, then it's not a binary, yes or no, you either have it or you don't. It's levels of degree, and the further you get into your company, just the further along that scale you, you go and you get. Exactly right. Yeah, you got it. So how important then like, is churn or retention in your evaluation of a company? You mentioned it's one of the things you look at, but how important is it at the different phases of growth of those companies? So you talked about an earlier stage company and then you talked about a later stage company. Yeah, so if you're doing a seed stage investment where it's really just a concept and you don't have very much done at all, then it would be lower in importance and far higher would be the quality of the entrepreneur and, and how much you like this idea. As they start getting traction, I think it's really one of the absolute top metrics because it's, it's the best indicator we have of product market fit. And product market fit is essential. You can't build a repeatable, scalable, and profitable growth process if you don't have product market fit and you're wasting your time to even start to try. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's probably one of the most powerful metrics that we have available to us. And the only other one that I would say is as powerful as that would be a measure of what kind of business benefit your customers are getting and whether you're actually delivering that or not. And do the customers agree that that's an extremely important business metric for them to, to really care about? 
So basically, how far up on your customer's budget list do you lie? Are you at the top or are you at the bottom? Yeah. Yes, and, and, and are you actually impacting the, you know, the business process that they bought you for? So if yeah. they bought you to get more leads, are you actually delivering more leads? Or did they bought you to improve the conversion rates of their leads? Are you actually improving the conversion rate of their funnel? Or if you want them to make your salespeople more productive, can they see in real productivity results that their salespeople are actually now more productive than they were before they started using your tool? And are those metrics that we just discussed important ones? All those three are very important to any business, but some of them, some of them are less important. Absolutely. And I, I think with that, though, as well, you definitely see a strong retention rate if you're seeing you're delivering value, because ultimately, when you're not delivering value, that's when customers start churning. In. Yes. So now, there, there is an interesting thing in here, if you don't mind me taking two seconds. Sure. Because I, I definitely um, believe it's worth founders thinking of a graph. And the, imagine the graph as having value on the vertical axis and usage on the horizontal axis. The worst product is one where you've got high usage and low value. So you're doing a lot of work, but you're not getting a lot of value out of that product. The very best product is one where you drop it in and you don't do any work and it automatically works away in the background and you get high value out of it. So that would be on, on the high left-hand side of the graph. Yeah. Most products fall probably more in the, you know, you've got to do a fair amount of usage to get the value out. But certainly, I mean, I'll give you an example of this. At, at HubSpot, one of the things that we struggled with in the early days was inside uh, inbound marketing was a brilliant, powerful concept. And no question of doubt, it would deliver you more leads. But there was one huge issue with it. You had to both do regular content, but you also had to do good content. So not only did it require a lot of work to deliver that business benefit, but it also required talent to deliver that business benefit. And that's not a great thing. So the, the, if you, the more you can find a product where there's no dependence on your customer to have talent and less work required by them and more business value delivered, that gets you into a better and better and better you know, segment of, of what kind of products will really work well. Okay. And also then what you're saying as well, in terms of, I think the speed is another aspect to that. So then the example of the blog and the content is typically something that you see uh, big returns, but the returns take longer to get to them as well. And uh, Exactly right. Yeah. So we started touching on like a few characteristics then. Um, it would be interesting to hear from your perspective. Uh, what have you seen some of the most successful companies do when it comes to churn and retention? Um, what are some of the key characteristics that these companies share that has this that, that helps them lead to the strong retention? Yeah, so one clear thing is they have built a great product. And so to me, I think one of the ways that that happens is you, at least one of the founders is a product person and is intimately familiar with the customer and the customer's problem and really has just a natural ability to translate what that customer wants into an actual working version of the product. Um, so that's probably the most important starting point of the whole lot there. Um, second characteristic is it, you really have to be great at onboarding the customers. So once you've sold it to them, make sure that they actually know how to get up and running and get using it and, and get usage out of it. And the more you can make the product do that automatically without them needing to have people doing that process, the better. Yeah. So again, it comes back to great product design is super helpful there because it can really make the product just intuitive and obvious to use without needing a long training session before you can actually get results out of it then. Um, another key characteristic for me of this is um, they have some metrics in place to understand what's happening here. So one metric that I like to see is they're measuring the onboarding process. Did the customer successfully come out of the onboarding, able to use the product and telling you that they were able to use it and scoring you highly on, on what they were able to achieve there? Um, so that that one of the reasons why I bring that up is that we found out that churn is most highly correlated with two things. Number one, did you onboard them successfully? And number two, did you lose your champion in the business? Um, those two things are the highest you know, indicators of churn. Now, yeah. if you think about the onboarding thing, a lot of people think they can stop churn by having a sales force that runs around trying to close everybody on the 11th month before the contract expires. But go back to your own experiences here. If you bought a product, the moment you bought it, you're actually kind of excited about it and you're willing to put in time and effort to make it work. If it doesn't work for you, you get really disillusioned 
And if somebody comes back to you 11 months later and says, hey, I want you to give this thing another try, it's a hell of a hard sell to get them to yep. retry this thing. So you've got to get them at that moment when they are excited and, and make it work then. So that'd be one. And then, you know, going back to the metrics here, I do think um, the companies that are great at this also have a way of measuring this effectiveness of the product. And so in the simplest case, you could measure usage of the product, but I don't love that. As I've mentioned before, you could be using something heavily and not getting a lot of business value from it. So I far prefer the idea of measuring business value and finding a way to say, is my product actually delivering on increasing the number of leads or increasing the conversion of leads in the funnel or increasing the productivity of my sales people, whatever your business thing that you're trying to yeah. impact. And because if you can measure that, then you've got a fantastic report that you can send to your champion every quarter that gives them a good reason to remember, oh yeah, we're paying for this thing, but we're getting more out of it than we we're paying for it. So this is a good thing to keep here. And if they get lost, you've still got easy justification for the CFO why that was money well spent. Um, so that's uh, a series of things. Then I think one of the, the other parts of this is they have negative churn. And you know, let's, let's explain negative churn for those that don't know it. Negative churn means that you're always going to lose some customers every year. So let's say you lose 10% of your customers every year. To have negative churn, the remaining 90% need to expand how much they're paying you so that they're filling up more than that 10% that you lost. And if you look at businesses like Zoom, um, Zoom has 130% revenue retention, which means that every year, every customer that they have spends 30%, well, on average, every customer they have spends 30% more next year than they did last year. And the year after that, they'll spend another 30% more. And the companies that have that business model, Zendesk got 122% or something like that uh, negative uh, re retention rate. And there are others out there that I've heard of that have even 140% no negative what, what yeah. revenue retention rate or negative churn. Those businesses are unbelievably successful and they get me very, very excited as a uh, investor out there because even if you stop all their sales and marketing, they would still keep That's growing. Well. This was actually one of the questions I had for you for later, but uh, if we had to look at sort of um, public companies currently, which is your favorite SaaS uh, company? And I, I had on my list, like Zoom was going to be one of those. I was thinking you would be mentioning that. Yeah, I, I, I am super excited about Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so I bought into that in a big way when it, it did its IPO, and it's, it's already up um, above 50%, actually, which is amazing. It's, it's drastically overpriced right now for, for where its revenue is. But yeah, I, I like the fact that it has viral marketing. So, you know, if you invite me to a Zoom and I see how well and easy it was to set up, I'm going to think about using that the next time around. Yeah. And I also like the fact that it has a bottoms up entry model. So an individual can start using it for free and then you get a lot of usage and then you can upsell the it. The land and expand. Yeah. yeah, the land and expand business model. I love that. And then I love the fact that it's really uh, entering a huge marketplace and um, the product really works. We, we threw out our $750,000 Cisco video conferencing system, replaced it with a Zoom room, oh. several Zoom rooms, and it's worked so well. And I yeah. see every one of my conversations with entrepreneurs is done on Zoom, just like this one is done on Zoom, without me prompting you to do it on Zoom. So I love them. I also happen to love, by the way, Atlassian, because they have a very low sales model. And wherever you're able to do that, you have something super powerful that takes place, which is all the money that, if you look at salesforce.com's sales and marketing line, it's a very high line. I don't remember the exact amount, but it'll be something like in the 40s to 50% of their uh, revenue will be spent on sales and marketing. Yep. And Atlassian is way down below that. So they were able to take all the money that they would have been spending on something that the customer doesn't care about, which is sales and marketing doesn't benefit the customer, put all of that into R&D, which does directly benefit the customer. So that creates a sort of a beneficial loop where you're giving the customer more of what they care about, which is great product. Um, and that's a much better investment. Yeah, we, we actually had someone from Atlassia, Sean Klaus, the previous, I think he was the previous VP of growth on the show. Uh, and he definitely spoke a lot to that as well, of, of not being a sales side of things, but then also, like you said, that land and expand model where anybody can just get started within the team with Jira. And then eventually these different units start popping up within an organization and somebody in the company comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, like we need to get a company account. Let's bring this in and uh, bring it into that. Yeah, product-led growth. 
Another thing you said as well, which was interesting, um, the first time that it's come up, is the concept of sort of having a champion within the company. And you led to, there was two things. So the one is the psychology and like really onboarding. And we've talked about that on a lot of the shows, like probably the biggest area you can improve retention is focusing on those first 90 days. But the thing that hasn't come up, and it's interesting to hear to your perspective, is how this came about, how you figured it out in terms of having that champion within the organization that drives and figuring out who that champion is. Yeah, yeah. Well, your champion is typically the person who helped you get the sale because they were willing to take a risk and um, they generally are a change agent of some kind that has got a little bit of, of, of um, grit to face up to taking a risk in their company and, and bringing in something new. And when that person leaves, if there's nobody else there who's a big supporter and fan of yours and you come up for renewal, you run a huge risk that at that moment in time, it just drops away. And the new person coming in to replace that person has got their own agenda and different tools that they're loyal to. And they really often want to prove that the previous guy wasn't actually that good and they're better than them. So they're going to change stuff up just to, to prove that. Yeah. And so we saw this happening time and again in companies that were seeing high churn is that this was a big factor behind why they were losing deals. So we thought that, uh, you know, if this is important, you should have a regular call into that customer at least quarterly to figure out, is your champion still there? And if there isn't, if they aren't still there, recognize that you've got a completely new sale to do, even though you're not going to get any revenue from that sale. Now you're going to save the renewal if you do manage to sell the replacement. But even better still is to anticipate um, what kinds of things you could do to, to um, do well, even if you do, do, do lose your champion. And I mentioned, for example, being able to produce ROI reports that get seen by a broader set of executives inside of that company. So yeah. a really clever thing is to find out, can you produce the report that gets seen either at the board level or in the management um, you know, regular Monday meeting that shows the status of your particular part of the department? Because that way you start getting built into the fabric of, of everybody who's a key decision maker there and they they know what you do and they know why you're useful and so they're not going to throw you out and making uh, your champion look good as well and basically doing the job for them exactly uh, so in that as well um what do you see some of the common challenges that people make and com some of the mistakes that you've seen companies do when they try to tackle churn so here's a big one um, I think there's a lot of companies out there that think if they hire a great VP of customer success, that should solve their churn problem. And really, the important thing to understand about churn is that it is actually a company problem, not a departmental problem. So if you think about product, anybody who's doing R&D, who does high quality engineering and develops without bugs, they can have a very big impact on not having churn just through, through a high quality product. The product management group doing a great job of defining the product well and building a great UI, they have a big impact, a much bigger impact probably than the customer success department can have. Yeah. Um, if the documentation, the people who are writing documentation in the help system have done a great job of writing that, that can also have a big impact on it. The salespeople can make a huge impact because if they oversell the product or if they sell it to the wrong kind of customers where it's not really a good fit, which they will often do if they're compensated wrongly, they will damage your churn rate. Um, you have all sorts of other you know, areas. Obviously, the support group and the onboarding group have a very high impact on the thing. Um, yeah. But even billing, they can annoy people with um, but the, the people who are doing pricing and packaging have a big impact on you know, whether, you, whether you get the churn right. So I think the starting point here is to recognize this is a company-wide problem. And yes, it makes sense to have a single individual perhaps tasked with trying to bring everybody together to focus on that problem but the CEO should be working with that person hand in hand to help them align all of these other groups. And everybody in the company should be thinking about churn and, and realizing that they can play a role in reducing churn. This, this is actually one of the biggest uh, reasons why I decided to start this uh, podcast because also I was quite tired of hearing these different stories of this magic number that magically solved churn or like a silver bullet that somebody came up with. And, uh, really, when you start to tackle it, you see like how much of an impact everybody in the company can make. And it's important that the company is aligned uh, to be solving this. Like it's not the responsibility of an individual or a single team. It's really like, let's see what we can do as a company, as an org, to align ourselves, to make sure that we focus. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You nailed it. 
So you talked as well about um, churn itself. Um, and I think like when we look at it as well, there's different ways to measure churn. Uh, and typically we can either look at customer churn or we can look at net tomorrow churn you mentioned in the case of Zendis. Uh, maybe you want to talk us through the different types uh, and ways of measuring churn and uh, which one is useful in which cases. Great. Okay. So let's start with customer churn, which would be simply the number of customers that you lost as a percentage of the total customer base. Uh, and that's clearly a very valuable uh, metric to have. But uh, imagine a situation where you've got only two customers and one's paying you $100 a month and the other one's paying you $1,000 a month. Obviously, if you lost the $100 customer, it's a lesser deal than if you lost the $1,000 customer. So yeah. <clears throat> you want to measure dollar churn. And gross dollar churn would say, if we lost the $100 customer, well, we lost $100 out of $1,100. So our percentage would be something like 8% or so. If we lost the $1,000 customer, we would have something like a 92% churn uh, of gross revenue churn. So customer churn would be 50% in both cases if we lost either one of them. So that's why you want both of those metrics. Now, the, uh, it's still useful to know how many customers you lost because if you're losing a lot of customers, you, it, it'll probably tell you something interesting about the fact that you may be selling to a set of customers that you probably don't want to be selling to and, or, or you maybe do want to be selling to them, but you don't have a good product market fit with them. Your pricing might be too high or your product features might not be right for them. So you want to segment your customer base and look at churn by segment, and it can be super powerful to actually break your customer base down and look at maybe enterprise customers differently from SMB customers and understand your churn rates there. Um, so then you get to the net dollar churn, and that means if there was expansion uh, in one of those customers, let's say, for example, let's go back to that story where we had only two customers, one at 100 and one at 1,000, and we lost the $100 customer, but the $1,000 customer ended up expanding from 1000 to, say, $1,300. Well, bingo, we got negative churn then, and that's a marvelous thing to have. So you really don't want to measure that as well. Yeah. So there's three, three metrics there for churn. You want your, your um, customer churn, your gross revenue churn, and your net revenue churn. Uh, and they're all very powerful indicators of how well your business is doing. To look into different aspects, um, yeah. In terms of like powerful indicators of how well your business is doing, I think it's something that you talk about a lot, and that's when it comes to like the LTV CAC ratio uh, and what makes a healthy business. So, uh, looking at the lifetime value to the ratio of the customer acquisition costs. Um, so I think it's it's three to one. You typically talk about quite a bit, but maybe you want to tell us like how did you come about this metric? Like what sort of gave you the first insight to say okay, this is what's a good indicator of a healthy business? Right. So this is this is fun because it, it goes right back to about 2007 2008 time frame, right yeah. at the very early days of SaaS, and it, it I kind of recognized that to my mind people needed to understand that in a recurring revenue business it was crucial to recognize you had a fundamental cash flow problem or at least p l problem, which was you were gonna spend a ton of money on acquiring the customer and there was a good chance you wouldn't necessarily make it back in the first year even. And if that was the case, you would have a very bad set of financials using normal accounting principles like gap accounting, which is a standard way that an investor would look at a business. And you would have to find a different way to look at that business to judge if it was gonna be good or not good. And the right way to do that would be to understand, well, listen, if I've got this customer, and even though I haven't really made profit out of them in the first year, but if I can keep them for another eight years or six years, and they're going to continue to pay me money, I got to have a great business here. So the best way that I could think of that, that we could represent that to investors and board members and management to understand if their business was working was to look at lifetime value of that customer and compare it to the cost to acquire that customer. So hence, I felt that that ratio, LTV to CAC, was a really important ratio. And I guessed at the three to one number. And the reason why I guess it would be more than, say, two to one or, or whatever was you have to have product expenses covered, GNA expenses, rent, all those sorts of things have to be covered as well as your selling expenses. So if you were just one to one, you were merely covering the sales expenses. That wasn't going to be any good. But yeah. in order to cover that plus to have some room to create some cash to, to go after signing up new customers. And it, it 
reality, I would say all the good businesses I've been involved with, they're actually above, say, four and a half, and three is really on the low side. But if you're not at three, forget it. Don't even you know, think about hitting any kind of accelerator pedal to grow your business. Go back and fix that number. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you're, if you're starting to be about four and a half, then you should start to feel good about yourselves and really think like, okay, now we're in the kind of, uh, and, and class leading companies, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Zoom might be as high as nine or, or 10. Uh, LGBT wow. um, yeah. So th there are some great. Uh, it's time to put the. the yeah, and I'll bet you Atlassian is extremely high on that list as well because their CAC is so low in their, in their yeah. picture. And there was another crucial metric that I introduced at the same time, which was months to recover CAC. And the reason why this one's so crucial is it turns out if you don't recover your CAC in, in a short period of time, you will burn through a boatload of capital trying to grow your business. Um, so this is about capital efficiency. And it turns out, again, I've done, I've looked at, at many businesses here. I originally said you should try to go aim for less than 12 months. To be honest, that was at a time when raising capital was much harder than it is now. And there was fewer yeah. dollars available. These days, I think you can get away with like 18 to 20 months of time to recover CAC. But remember that if you are that high, you will be burning a, a, a fair amount more capital than somebody who's able to do it at, at 12 months or less. Yeah. And I think as well, like one of the big drivers in this is retention really helps accelerate that payback period uh, as well. When you've got a good uh, retention model, it also helps you to build like uh, your competitive muscle when it comes to acquisition channels as well. If you have a really strong acquisition um, retention, then it really helps you drive those uh, that uh, CAC down as well, months to yeah, recover. Yeah, you, you couldn't have said it better because, you know, if you think about most people think about it driving only the LTV side of the house. But if you're losing customers, you're going to have some unhappy references out there that are eventually going to start growing big enough that along the line, when you start trying to acquire new customers, the word's going to be out there that now we tried that thing and it didn't work. And that will yep. make it way harder for you to sell your product than if you've got really happy customers that are acting as references that create a viral, not a viral, but a, a retention loop for you. Yeah, and the more customers that you retain every month, that's more money being paid back to you every month. So, like you said, like payback period just really, really decreases with it. Yes. Um, so, I'm really intrigued as well. Like you mentioned earlier, that you, the 2007, 2008 is when you first started talking about these metrics in the early days of SaaS. Like, uh, I'm intrigued. Like, what really attracted you to SaaS in the beginning, and like, what really uh, got you excited about this business model? Well, so there were two things here. First of all, I was very early into open source uh, with an investment in JBoss in 2003. And if you think about what we were doing at JBoss, we were giving software away free. We had 5 million free users of JBoss, and we were monetizing them later on. We were monetizing them with a recurring revenue model, so we understood the incredible power of recurring revenue yeah. as a phenomenally potent um, business model, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and it was essentially one of those uh, you know, product-led businesses that, that had this recurring revenue thing. So let's go back to what, what I learned out of that. Well, if I, having taken a company uh, public that had non-recurring revenue, you realized that you had this scary thing every single quarter. At the end of the quarter, you felt great for one day, and then half a day later, you were sitting there nervous and worried because now you had to completely climb the entire revenue ramp all over again from scratch. Yeah. If you have a recurring revenue model, everything that was there last quarter was going to be there again this quarter, and anything you added would simply increase the amount of revenue you had. So any person who's run a business and who's tried to do it with the old license model will tell you that that's a nerve-wracking business model, and this is a fabulous business model. And then I also realized that if you talk to people who are investors in public companies, probably one of the things that they value the greatest is predictability of the business, and knowing that you're not going to get a surprise. You're not going to get a shock. And yeah. having that predictability for many years ahead gives them a reason why they will value that company far higher than they would do with something that is just not that and could fall off a cliff tomorrow. Yeah. So predictability, definitely. I think that's, at least for me, is one of the most interesting aspects because I definitely see like that stress levels every quarter trying to make your sales cut, but knowing that you have this predictable revenue coming in definitely put you in a much better position as an entrepreneur as well. Yeah. Um, and I will say that, you know, that 
it took me a little bit longer to, it's probably around about 2009, 2010, when I finally figured out the negative uh, churn thing. That was yeah. one of the most important unlocks in this business model. And it was really fascinating because at HubSpot, we had what we thought was really cool, which was a single product at a single price point. But you cannot get the negative churn with one product and one price point. In order to get it, you have to have the ability to upsell or cross-sell different products or expand within that product. And so we came up with this importance. And we'd actually done the same thing at JBoss many years earlier, which has figured out we had, we had five pricing axes at JBoss wow. that we would use. So we could get $10,000 from a small customer, but a million dollars for exactly the same product from a large customer. And we had to have ways to justify why we were going to charge them a million dollars for exactly the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so hence the five axes that, that denoted different ways that they would get more value from the product. I, I think as well, like this is something we, again, we talked about quite a bit, but in terms of expansion revenue and coming down to pricing and packaging is definitely one of those biggest levers that you can pull as well when it comes. Um, Interesting as well, like I think uh, I watched as well uh, um, a video where you talked about the HubSpot case and looking at sort of what the value metrics were that you decided to pick. Uh, how did you figure that out in the early days and as well and maybe a JBoss, like what sort of led you to the insights to pick those five different axes and understand or at HubSpot where it was uh, sales, um, I think you have leads as one of those metrics, there's a few other different metrics. Like, yeah, in, in, in HubSpot's case, it's the number of leads that are inside of your database with them. Yeah. And there's two things that made that a particularly useful metric. One of them was that if you were using HubSpot, it was going to generate more leads for you. That was its first you know, primary business driver as to why you would buy it. Yeah. And so it was great in the sense that if they were successful for the customer, it would automatically create growth in the number of leads and therefore the amount of revenue that would get. But secondly, I think this is maybe more important, is if you're the customer, it's really important that when you're pay, asked to pay more money for something, you feel good about it. And if you're getting more leads, generally you're going to feel very good about something, yeah. the fact that you're getting value from this product. So it aligned well with the customer's perception of value. And that's kind of what you're trying to do when you come up with these axes, is figure out how does the customer perceive value and how can I align my pricing with that so that when I just give them a high price point, they don't think of it as high. They think of it as being, wow, that's a great deal because the value that I'm getting from that thing is much greater than the amount of money they want to charge me for that. Absolutely. Uh, I think this is something as well. Commonly, like people default to cost-based pricing, uh, but when you start to realize the value in value-based pricing, it sort of unlocks a whole new uh, potential for your business. And uh, I think in SaaS business, specifically at the early stage, like pricing is definitely one of the things you just guess. It's like, uh, what should we charge? And you just go around the market, take a look at a few different pages. Okay, fifty nine ninety nine sounds good or whatever it is. And yeah. uh, when you start to realize the importance of it, you really start to see the potential that it does have to have a really good solid pricing strategy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Cool. Uh, last question I have for you, David, is um, why investing? Sort of, you're a five times founder. You've uh, been through it all, obviously, when it comes to building startups. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you had two or three companies go public as well like why what made you decide to sort of step back and say okay i want to start investing now yeah well it, it was less a decision to do investing and more after doing five startups they're they're grueling they're a grind i mean there's no question of that you know even when they go extremely well you're putting your entire life into it you have no time for for anything else at all and frankly, after doing five, I felt like, wow, I'm just going to live the same movie over and over again. And, and what, I'm in, what I really enjoyed doing, I love helping other people. I like teaching. I like, um, you know, I love, there's nothing more that I enjoy sitting down, talking to a founder about what's going on in their business and seeing if I can help them. And so I knew that I wanted to do that. And I knew that if I, if I was going to do that, I would need to have a way to make money to support myself. And it turns out that actually being a VC, uh, is a particularly good alignment of those two things, because particularly with the model of how we invest, which is very deep personal engagement with our portfolio companies, spending time with them, really trying to help them out. Um, you put in a lot of that work, and it's a bit different to being the entrepreneur. I, I often liken it to being the grandparent. You, you, yeah. You're there at the exciting moments where you're formulating the strategy of the company, and then for the next three months, the company has to go up and execute on that. That's kind of dull and boring, because uh, yeah. nothing really new happened there. So. You then check in with them again, you know, maybe a month later, and you, you're at the high.
high-level strategic part, which is the most fun part of it, and you're doing it with several businesses. So I really enjoyed that, and investing turned out to be a, a, a very, very rewarding and fun path for me. Which I can imagine. And you, you get to spend a lot of time then with some really talented founders, and you're always like on the pulse of what's new and what's happening. Definitely. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, that's 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 a huge attraction. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm such an early adopter. If there is even half a day that the newest Apple product is, is being exactly. the show, I haven't got it. I'm I'm in, you know, cursing for something. Sorry, that I have to have everything the moment it comes out, and um, I love trying. Likewise, new I'm a sucker for new things. Definitely. So it's super exciting hearing, you know, how people are thinking about. You know, we have a very cool startup that um, takes the. Uh, neuro signals that your brain sends down to your hands to figure out to, uh, what your muscles should do. And by putting a cuff on your arm, they're able to interpret all of those signals. So one of the demos that they do that's absolutely genius is they give you a keyboard and you wear these cuffs and you type for about five minutes and they then take the keyboard away and you're able to continue typing in fresh air and they will put the letters up there as though you've typed on a real keyboard based on the signals that they're reading off the surface of your skin. So you, you kind of see ideas like that that are right at the cutting edge. Yeah, yeah, and that excites me just listening to it as well, being able to have access to this constantly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I said last question actually, but I think maybe one last thing I'd like you to leave the audience with as well is um, let's imagine you getting started now, like at a, a company now that you're going to be working with portfolio. You see the company is really like the retention levels are very low, churn is high. Uh, what is one of the first things you would do to try and help this company turn things around? Like, what would be your advice? Or what would you advise them to go out and start looking at? Right. So, I, the, 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 one of the, the immediate things I would do is get them to stop spending money and recognize that they don't have product market fit and it's not clear how long it's going to take them to fix this problem and keep their burn as low as possible uh, and then have the founders who've got the greatest product DNA get out there with the customers and understand What's going wrong? So first thing you want is an analysis of exactly why is churn happening? Is churn happening because they were onboarded badly? Is churn happening because the product doesn't work in some crucial capacity? Is churn happening because you sold them incorrectly and they, they you know, you, you oversold this thing? So understand the reason behind the churn and then obviously go and fix that reason. But almost invariably, the reason is going to come back to the product. And the fact that is the product is either not delivering the goods that you thought it would deliver. And in some startups, if you're a very early stage startup, this may be a time to actually really recognize your business may not be viable. And one of the smartest things you could do is shut this thing down and stop wasting your time on it and That'd go somewhere precious. else. Yeah. But let's, you know, let's face facts. You've got to get the balance here right because the best entrepreneurs have grit to go through tough moments like that and figure out how to solve that problem. Um, but you don't want to overdo that to the point where you're wasting three, four years of the best years of your life on something that fundamentally was never a good problem to be tackling in the first place. You know, my top advice for people here is I see entrepreneur after entrepreneur after entrepreneur does not do enough customer development before they build the product. So they build something because they're convinced that they know how the customer, what the customers are going to like. And then they finally start showing it to customers. They discover that well, it's sort of interesting to them. They'll have meetings with them, but people aren't buying the damn thing or, or they're yeah. buying it. They're not, not seeing it. So my top advice to entrepreneurs these days is, look, you, you should do 50 to 60 phone calls with customers, potential customers, before you've gone further than building just some kind of a prototype, even if it's just a PowerPoint deck that shows what the screens are going to do for them and validate that they really care about that, that that's actually a high priority thing that they really need and that they'll pay money for. Yeah. And you, that work in, you'll save yourself so much expense and hassle later on. If you've built the wrong product, you're not going to modify that product to make it right. That's that's incredible wasted energy compared to if you've got it right before you started building. It's painful listening to this because I've made all of these mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Yeah. I made them all myself, which is why I'm so emphatic about them too. I'm just trying to help people stop making the mistakes that I made as well. Yeah. Well, David, thanks very, very much. It's been a pleasure having you today. Uh, I'm sure the listeners are going to pull out a lot of valuable insights from this uh, episode. And uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, my pleasure. Great talking to you. Thank you. Cheers. And that's a wrap for the show today with me, Andrew Michael. 
I really hope you enjoyed it and you're able to pull out something valuable for your business. To keep up to date with Churn.fm and be notified about new episodes, blog posts, and more, subscribe to our mailing list by visiting churn.fm. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have any feedback, good or bad, I would love to hear from you. And you can provide your blunt, direct feedback by sending it to andrew at churn.fm. Lastly, but most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it and leave a review as it really helps get the word out and grow the community. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.